award-winning journalist and author Frankie Adossi in, uh, with us. Um, he, is, uh, uh, he, he, he was a New York Post journalist and he teaches journalism in New York University. Uh, his memoir, The Lives of Great Men, has won uh, Lambda Literary uh, Award. So welcome to the Hindu, uh, Frankie. Thank nice, you nice so much. Nice to have you here. Thank you so uh, very much. So, uh, so my, my, I was thinking that uh, what triggered the book? I mean, uh, when did you decide that you have to write a memoir? You have to write about these people? So, um, several years ago, I was in Accra, Ghana, where I spent a considerable amount of my year teaching. And this particular summer, it seemed to me as if every day when I picked up the newspaper, there was um, a front page article about LGBT Ghanaians. And often, actually, almost always, it was uh, framed in the negative. You know, these lesbians are doing something terrible, or these gay men are trying to recruit someone. It was almost, um, it was an onslaught, you know. And what was so shocking for me was that it didn't seem to be normal, because I had been there um, the same time period the year before. And I had seen, you know, LGBT people, not exactly just everywhere, but certainly not in hiding. And within one year, um, many of those people had just completely retreated. And it was as if they didn't exist in that society anymore. And so I decided to just write one story about what's going on here. I mean, um, and I did that one story, and that led to me um, doing a lot more reporting on, and saying to myself that one magazine story cannot really adequately tell what was happening here. But I needed to do more. And then, um, about five years ago, um, in Nigeria, um, the then president, Goodluck Jonathan, signed a bill called the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. And it was one of the most draconian anti-LGBT bills ever. So it didn't just ban like marriage, as the the title says, but it banned organizations, it banned people from congregating, it banned public displays of affection. Um, but beyond that, the coverage at the time of what was going on seemed to um, always seem to say that you know, 90, 90 something percent of the population supports it, and there was the framing of this narrative that there weren't really that many or even any. LGBT people of consequence um, in Nigeria. And I thought, this is not exactly true. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to hurry up and finish the book. And so, so that was not really the trigger, but that was a push that I needed to finish what I had started in Ghana, collecting stories. And so what I did was that I continued to write, I continued to travel around the continent, and there were all these narratives that were similar and, and uh, in different places. And these are the stories that um, became the bulk of lives of great men, especially when I uh, thought about my own journey and contrasted my journey with these wonderful men and women I was meeting all over the continent. And that's how the book came about. So this ban um, is still in place, right? It that is. It's been five years. It's, it's been, five, been years. five years. And the repercussions of that are quite terrible because now if you are in Nigeria, um, people feel like they can attack gay people with impunity because they feel like you can't go to the police. And if you do go to the police, they might even intimidate you. They might extort you. So it's like people feel like, well, these are criminals anyway. So, you know, if a person who is gay is attacked and beat up by their neighbor, there is no recourse because people feel like we can do anything after all. If, if you go to the police, you'll be jailed for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And you see that in you know, in all sectors of the society where people feel like this law has emboldened homophobes to take center stage. Yes. And the Nigeria that I know was not always like this. Um, so something has changed, and part of that is as a result of this law. Then how was your book received in Nigeria? You got applause, criticisms, or even threats? <laughs> yeah. um, I've been, since the book came out, I launched a book in Nigeria in October at the Ake, um, Arts and Book Fair, and it was a wonderful reception. Lots of people lined up to buy it, and um, lots of great questions. And then I returned to Nigeria um, about three weeks ago, just before Christmas, 
and I did a book reading in Nigeria's capital Abuja. I did two readings actually, two public events, and again, throngs of people uh, showing up, picking up the book, asking good questions about it. I think one of the things about the book is that there has not been a three-dimensional representation of LGBT people in literature, in media, um, in a very long time, if ever, in our country. So to see a, 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 a book like Lives of Great Men that does not make fun of anyone, but shows complexity and people's uh, complete lives is a first for many people. And so they, um, for the most part, um, I haven't gotten any um, negative feedback from the book. I'm sure that at some point it will happen. Yeah. But most Nigerians who have read it and have written to me, really the thing they say most is thank you. Thank you for doing yeah, this. Thank you for putting this um, out there because it really um, shatters the myth that uh, those folks don't exist in these countries, particularly yeah. Nigeria. Yeah. And uh, you are a practicing Catholic. You have written about it. Yes. <laughs> uh, so I was just wondering. I mean, how do you find it? Uh, how do you find yourself being gay and Catholic? I'm asking this because the church is known uh, to have uh, very strong or anti-gay positions. Yes. Uh, so are conservative Catholic yes. uh, families as well. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, find it? So for me. Um, <laughs> One of the things that has been very interesting to me in my own journey was that I, I teach journalism and I always ask people to look for nuance. Nothing is ever black and white. Yeah. Look for um, a, 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 the complete picture. And I am guilty of um, you know, separating myself from the Catholic Church because I just absolutely believe that you know, the leadership on down were very anti-LGBT. You know, until I walked into a church uh, on 15th Street in Manhattan in New York called St. Francis Xavier. Um, it's a Jesuit community. And I walked into this church and it's, uh, you know, as Catholic as can be. But the day that I walked in there was an evening where they were celebrating their LGBT congregants. I just happened to go in that day. And the priest, you know, he just looked out and he was like, come closer. You know, this is for everybody, but particularly the LGBT people, he wanted them in the front row, not at the back of the church, not hidden, not tentative. And he made the point of saying, this is your church as well. This is your church, this is your God, this is your faith, and you have every right to be here as everybody else. And so I started my return to, um, to the church in St. Francis area, and then the more that I looked, the more that I realized that I was guilty of um, what I had always accused other people of doing, like painting all of us with the same brush. But there I was painting the entire Catholic Church with the same brush. Is the Catholic Church um, perfect? <laughs> no. Yeah. But there are lots of fathers and bishops and priests who love their gay congregants and wants them in there and don't want to separate it. So I am very much at ease with being a practicing Catholic oh. and a gay person. And the more that I've looked into my own life, I just I just realized that I cannot have, um, I cannot be such a, a, a sinner or such a terrible person if I have all these blessings in my life. Yeah. You know, and I'm very thankful for the blessings that I have. But I know that my God created me in his image and likeness. And my God wanted me to be gay, which is why I was created this way. Yeah. Um, okay. So no conflict there. OK, yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, let's take a deeper look at Nigeria, where you're coming from. Uh, you left Nigeria uh, when you were 19 years old. Uh, uh, and uh, see, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful country, in a sense. It's a country that survived a civil war, that, that survived military dictatorships. Yes. It's also a country that produced great writers. We have Achebe, we have Adiche, and we have Frangi. It does it now. <laughs> yeah, it now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So uh, how do you look at uh, Nigeria from uh, now where you are now? Uh, how the country has evolved over the years? So I, um, Nigeria is, um, is a place that is constantly changing. I left Nigeria when I was um, 19 years old, and I returned to America. I was born in New Jersey, um, 
I, and I had not been back to America for a very long time. And I returned to America to go to university. My parents at the time still lived in Nigeria, so I just expected that when I finished in the university, I would return to Nigeria, uh, because we were quite a, a close-knit family. Um, um, but as I, as I developed a career in the United States, and my mother is also American, and she you know, returned to retire back home in Brooklyn, I realized that uh, I have this love for Nigeria as my fatherland, um, but I also have this great love for America that made me comfortable in who I was. You know, America allowed me to be, think of myself as being the best that I can be with no limits, but also that it was okay for me to be gay or whatever it was that I am, as long as I excelled and as long as I worked hard. That American sensibility is what I took back home when I returned to Africa to work, in which saying that, you know, no matter what we have been told about ourselves as African people, we can be the best of anything, and we have the most diversity. It's only in recent times that people have tried to make us this generation of Africans believe that um, we can be one-dimensional, you know. But when I look back at our history, we've had all kinds of fluidity mm -hmm. among us, all kinds of diversity among us. We didn't always label them, you know. So this phenomenon of labeling LGBT and QIA and all the rest of it is a relatively new phenomenon, but that does not mean that we didn't have difference in our community. That does not mean that we didn't have all sorts of diversity. So for me, when I look at Nigeria and when I return and when I work in Nigeria and when I uh, engage with my, my brothers and sisters and friends and lovers and all of them there, it is to say that we have to be the best that we can be, acknowledging our history, acknowledging that we have all sorts of diversity. And um, I think it's going okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's the f you know my book is the first book of its kind, but the fact that so many people wanted it so badly, the fact that so many people are reading it, the fact that it's pushing people to tell their own stories and not to accept this narrative that there's only one kind of Nigerian is a good thing. And I think that in terms of our cultural space and in terms of literature, you will see much more voices um, telling their own story. And that is the best that I can hope for, is that everybody gets a chance to um, be their best selves, whether they're in Nigeria or they're in the United States or here in Chennai. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll ask one foreign policy question, which is interviews here, uh, you know, never completed unless you have a foreign policy question. Mm -hmm. So uh, in an MSNBC uh, interview, uh, in a discussion which you participated after the election of President Donald Trump, uh, you said that whenever America goes uh, to a foreign country, to an African country, its moral voice follows. And you, you uh, expressed doubt on whether the same would be the case with the foreign policy of the Trump administration. So now, um, uh, with the president uh, almost two years into his uh, tenure, how do you look at the U.S. policy towards Africa? It's evolving. Um, I think, you know, in the past uh, couple of years, the policy towards Africa was, was very, very clear. I think in the last two years, it's, it's evolving. It's changing. There are conversations. But what is clear, what remains clear, is that the United States and these African countries are still engaging. Even as African countries engage with China and engage with Japan and engage with um, the EU, there is a place in all of these countries' foreign policy for America. America has not lost its luster. America has not lost its status. America is still a beacon of hope and excellence. But what I always say to my friends is that, you know, as on the continent um, we struggle with uh, democratic principles, we can see that democracy is always a work in progress, you know, even in developed countries. So I think that two years into the Trump administration, Africa has not lost um, its importance to the United States. Definitely you see that over the Christmas holiday, there were a throng of African-American um, public uh, cultural icons 
who returned to West Africa, and they're calling this year the, the year of the homecoming. They all went to Ghana, and everyone is sort of retracing their steps, because Africa, regardless of who is in power, Africa and America are tied. America is still a place where we want to engage as Africans. And fantastically, you know, regardless of who is running um, the country, America still sees Africa as a place to engage in. Certainly, in um, you know, under the Trump administration, we saw that at least the Secretary of State has come, you know, two years in, uh, and engaged with these African countries. And many African presidents have already been invited to the White House. So, you know, we're still we're still in the game. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frankie. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. It's yeah. been a Can real, I, real pleasure. Thank you yeah. so much. You. I, I'm really grateful.